Um, we, have, we have one more keynote, and this one is, uh, is from Red Hat. And I, uh, I got a little peek at it earlier today while they were running through it, and I noticed that a lot of you actually make an appearance in it. Um, so this is, uh, this is going to be really great. So at this time, I want to go ahead and bring up the CTO and VP of Global Engineering from Red Hat, Brian Stevens. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, you know, I've been to probably three or four of these, and I've got to say that every one of these things gets monstrously bigger, as you guys have seen, and spent a lot of time back there and other parts of it with Jonathan and on the board. And I've got to say that, you know, Jonathan, Lauren, Mark, you know, this thing just like exploding in scale, not just like the cloud, but just this event. And these guys handle it with just like what you just saw with like, with like grace and calmness that I've never seen before. So we're, we're in good hands. Um, so I want to talk to you about a couple of things. Obviously, we want to talk a lot about what Red Hat's doing today around OpenStack. Um, but I think before we get into what we're doing today, we want to back up in time a little bit. So all the way back to, as everybody was talking about in 2010, um, for us, it started with, with a phone call from Jim Curry at Rackspace. Right? And so what he said was, was the dream. Right? He says, we want to build this ubiquitous cloud computing platform with the community. We want to be able to make it meet all of the needs, not some of the needs, all the needs of the public cloud, all the needs of the private cloud. It's going to be really simple to install, and it's just going to scale forever. And we're like, I'm just sitting on the end of the phone. You know, we've heard this before. Red Hat didn't, might have been like, we're going to create the new database. Might be able to, you know, we're going to create, you know, a new um, system X, Y, Z. It didn't really matter. We've heard it a million times before. And we said, yeah, it's an awesome vision, but we can appreciate in open source how hard it is to catalyze a community and bring it up. So it took us a while. So 2011 rolled around. You know, we joined the summits, and you know, um, but we didn't really get that actively involved until um, 2011. It was in August. And we assigned a first developer to start working on OpenStack. And um, he's here. His name is Mark McLaughlin. And he had a mission. And his mission was first just start small, one developer. And we have an open distribution that we get in the hands of millions of users called Fedora. And so you know, Fedora was a great place for us to put OpenStack inside. And so that was what Mark's uh, mission was uh, by joining. And this is actually his first patch. And so his first patch was really simple because we've got this weird model. We've got this upstream model inside of Red Hat. Instead of just like taking OpenStack, hacking it into Fedora, making changes there on your local copy, we really work upstream first. And so there's some things that Mark needed to change to make, Fedora, make OpenStack fit inside of Fedora. And he did it on the public mailing list. And this was signed off by Josh McKenty um, on August 24th of 2011. And so that was our Red Hat's first involvement. The very next day, um, I sent out this memo inside of, uh, um, inside of Red Hat, and it really was, you know, obviously it's not confidential anymore, but it was really just this recognition that everything that Jim and Rackspace had said to us 10 months earlier was coming true. It's a recognition that, that this brand now had global awareness, and it was a mission, it, was about, it wasn't just about what they were doing, it was how they were doing it. They were doing it in the open way with this vibrant community. And for Red Hat, it was like, this wasn't a marketing statement. This is like, we got to be all into this thing. This is like how we operate. How can we not be a part of it? So we began, and that, the response to that memo was huge because there's all these people saying, hey, there's this great thing happening out there in open source, and we're not really a part of it. So the response was really huge. And, you know, the best one was just like, first thought, wow, let's do this thing. And so, so we did. So we, we started. Um, we joined the first, luckily, the uh, first design summit that we participated was in, our, was in our backyard in Boston. So our headquarters for engineering is in about 30 miles outside of Boston. So we joined that design summit. Um, and then not long after that, Rackspace started about spinning out the foundation. And I was just scratching my head, like, these guys got this great brand. They got a tiger by the tail. They got um, you know, all this code coming up. Everybody loves it. They're the leading developer. And they just want to federate it. And I, I have to say, I was just so impressed by the fact that they were, you know, because you just don't, there's very few times that you've ever seen something like that happen. And they pushed it away. And so we were all in right from the beginning. I mean, they just wanted to see how do we raise an industry and not just raise a company. So, you know, 2012 comes along and Essex ships. So that's the first time that we actually had some Red Hat contributed code inside of um, an OpenStack distribution. Um, the foundation, you know, was, was up and running. As we said, it's been up for about six months. Um, Red Hat joined on a platinum level. We thought about it from two things. We usually just sort of show up with code. But we said, you know what, I think it's important that we make a statement by joining the foundation. And that was for, in part, two parts. It's just as, as Jonathan and others talk about is like, how do we protect this great thing? And we, want it, we worry about it and we want to protect it. But then I also have this other dimension that I really worry about. The foundation gets too much in the way of the developers. So my concern is like, so how do we do just enough but not get in their way? Because they've already proven that they can go fast and furious and, and, and really do great things. 
And then later in 2012 was the Folsom release, so we haven't been, Red Hat hadn't been involved that long at that point in time, just over a year, um, but we at that point had become the number two developer to, um, to, to Folsom, so we we're pretty proud of that. Um, and this is what the team looked like back in 2012. This was in October 2012, so this is the main leadership for the OpenStack team back then. And um, instead of you know, meeting in Boston, and these guys go to Dublin, I think they find, they, they plan better when there's a great city with great beer. Um, and that's here we are now. So now Grizzly's out, right? And so we're pretty proud of this stat as well. So, so these guys just sort of, it's actually, at Red Hat, it's hard to keep people away from OpenStack because it is such an interesting and hot project that you know, a lot of people naturally grab it to it. Whether their manager assigns them to it or not, they want to be a part of it. And so you know, this wasn't like some corporate mission, like we want to be like a top developer of OpenStack. It really wasn't about that. It was just sort of the natural proclivity of the engineers to want to be on this cool community thing. And so we're proud that we sort of you know, are leading the contributions. You know, that'll change. The best part about it, though, is that, as, you, as you've heard, is that if this chart fanned all the way out and included the others category, you'll see the others category is one of the largest uh, contributors to OpenStack, and that's just a really great thing. But again, we, you know, it's, it's, you know the, the goal isn't to be the top developer. The goal is just really you know, how we write software at Red Hat. So we want to talk a little bit about that model. We've got a little bit different model than most. I don't think there's a right model for how you think about open source if you're a software vendor. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, Intel and others get involved enough to sort of optimize their hardware. Um, others, you know, believe in the open core model where they get a common core out there and then they upsell proprietary. Others, I mean, you see this a lot with quantum. There's particular areas of open source that they want to get invest in because then they can enable great things with maybe their existing portfolio. And you see that, you know, um, in spades with quantum and everything around networking with, with Junipers and others' involvement. And others really don't do a lot of upstream contribution, but they, but they take the product, they take the body of works and support it for customers. But then there's some, and like us, we just go all in. So we don't really make that separation, which is sort of 100% open source, and it's, and it's not just a commitment of supplying open source to our customers, open source has become our development model. So when we look at sort of like what the trunk is, the trunk for us for our software products is externally. You know, we don't keep shadow trees and develop first inside and then decide when to release code. Really the life cycle of software development at Red Hat, you know, starts first and foremost upstream. And it works, so, you know, less, you know, you know, when I joined Red Hat 11, 12 years ago, you know, if anybody told me that you could make money selling free software, I mean, it's a pretty hard thing to do for salespeople, but we, we broke the billion dollar barrier a year ago, and now our latest fiscal uh, results were somewhere north of 1.3 billion, all on open source. Um, but that said, it's not a business model, so I think a lot of people get fooled into open source, put it in our tagline, and it's a business model, it's not. It's just, the, it's just simply the best development model on the planet because it enables that collaboration of developers, and, and the more developers that have great diversity are just gonna develop better software. There's just no other way around that. And users win because all of a sudden the users are the ones that are in the control. They can consume technology sort of you know, on their path, the modules that they want and at the cadence they want, and that just never really happens in the proprietary software world. So before we got involved in OpenStack, um, we actually got in involved in another project. And that was really because, this, it was saying you know, that, that big unicorn was out there, and our developers were all starting to use it. So our developers, you know, in the past, just like a normal organization, were always waiting on, as our business grew, waiting on hardware resources. So they just quickly, they didn't wait for permission, they just gravitated to Amazon. And so we had you know, hundreds and hundreds of developers using Amazon, and what we found was, though, these guys are all becoming cloud experts. So that wasn't their mission, but they all became cloud experts. They had to understand the interfaces, the terms of service, how to stand up workload, um, on and on and on and on. Um, and that felt kind of broken to us. So we didn't know there was a category that back then called platform as a service. It wasn't that Red Hat says we need to have a platform as a service product. But what we did know is that, that there was a, a lot we could do to substantially change the development, um, you know, ease of development that our developers could have when using a, a public infrastructure cloud. And that was really what OpenShift became. It was a, a service that we built on top of Amazon, really for ourselves. And then it just, and then it just got bigger than that. And the idea is it's just a polyglot system that you can develop in the language that you care about, PHP, Ruby, Java, whatever. And we just package these things up and the community packages up in modules, whether that's a, you know, could be a database, could be a language. Um, and the best part about it though is the developer doesn't know about the infrastructure cloud anymore. They just have no awareness that it's even there. So really, you know, this presentation itself was written in Git, right? And I never once logged into Amazon Cloud or even looked at Amazon. I just developed in Git on my local sandbox. And then what happens is when you want to uh, push your changes, the changes, OpenShift takes your changes and it deals with pushing them up to the public cloud. It deals with packaging them and continuous integration, 
Um, there's thousands of RHEL servers actually up running on top of Amazon Cloud. And so the, what the OpenShift, the service does, is decide where to put your application, because it compacts it on a RHEL server along with a lot of other applications. Um, and it deals with plumbing the DNS and load balancers and all of those other things that the developers just don't need to worry about. And all that happens in about a 10, 10 second interval from the time you actually change your code to actually push it up. And the best part about it is, as a systems vendor, you know, predominantly known for Linux, we're constantly looking at the roadmap of all these things that we need to put in Linux because our customers care. And three of those things that, that for the first time we're like a recipient of, we're a consumer of them on the OpenShift cloud. And what that means is because, so if you're thinking about it, you don't want one app per VM on, you know, it's just a waste of money and a waste of resources. So what that means is you've got to consolidate lots of apps on a small number of VMs um, and things like Linux containers, SE Linux for security, and then all of the QoS stuff that's coming in C groups is really making that happen. So now you can actually, we'll have hundreds and hundreds of apps on a single rel instance running on, a, running on the Amazon cloud, um, all you know, with, with great performance. So today there's about a um, quarter of a million apps up and running on Amazon. And the best part is, so we started there saying we want to, make, we want to change developers' lives. And now all of a sudden, you know, come along um, OpenStack, and now what's happening is now that OpenShift is actually an enterprise product, the deploys we're doing inside of our customer environments now are typically OpenShift on top of OpenStack. Because with that, all of a sudden, OpenShift, the service, is able to deliver elasticity at the application level. So I wanted to show you what that looks like. My name is Luke Meyer, and I work as an engineer on OpenShift Enterprise by Red Hat. So I'm going to be demonstrating a quick installation of OpenShift using the OpenStack infrastructure. Starting with an empty OpenStack project, I'm going to create two instances for my initial OpenShift Enterprise installation. OpenShift requires hosts for two major purposes. First, it requires a broker, which provides the user interface and manages the interaction with the applications. There are actually multiple components to the broker, which can be separated out into multiple hosts, but for simplicity, we're just going to install everything on one host. Secondly, OpenShift requires one or more OpenShift node hosts. These are where applications actually live and run. Each application consists of one or more gears, which are sort of like pseudo virtual machines within the host. But instead of each gear running its own operating system with all the overhead that entails, each gear uses host resources directly, but is contained by Red Hat Enterprise Linux system features like SE Linux and C groups so that its resources are limited and it can't interact with other gears on the same host. We like to use external storage for gears so that they can survive in the case of a node failure or administrator error. OpenStack lets us easily create a storage volume for this and associate it with the node host. Once the hosts are up and running, we need to actually run the installation. After subscribing the hosts, we run an install script on each. This installs a lot of packages via yum, and then configures them to work together as an OpenShift installation. We're going to fast forward this a bit, but it's really just a few tens of minutes. You can definitely finish this before launch. With the installation complete, I'm going to snapshot the node host in OpenStack and use it as a template for adding more nodes later. I'm going to add on some proof of concept code that will enable us to scale automatically with OpenStack. I need to install cloud in it and some code that will initialize the host when it boots from the image. And I'll do a little cleanup first to make the installation go smoothly. Then I'll just snapshot the node host and wait for it to show up as an available image. Now I'm going to create some applications, which can be done in several ways. We'll start with the command line tool RHC. First I need to get set up with my new OpenShift installation. And now I'll just create a PHP application. Then we'll go visit the web page, and you'll see that it has the initial demo content. Next, I'll use the web console to create a scaled application. With the scaled application, as traffic increases, OpenShift can increase application resources by adding extra gears to the application and load balancing the traffic between the gears. I'm going to use this scaled app to demonstrate scaling up OpenShift itself. I'm going to enable the OpenShift broker to access the OpenStack API in order to instantiate more node hosts. First, I'll install the Nova client. 
Now I'm going to sync over some proof of concept code for monitoring resources and using Nova to request new nodes. Finally, I'll check that the OpenStack credentials I synced over are working. And it looks good. So I'm ready to start scaling. I'm going to watch the current status of node hosts in the top window, and I'm going to watch the capacity checker logs in the middle window. So let's say I deploy the backhand REST API for a really addictive mobile app on that scaled app, and it's gone viral. Traffic is pouring in. As it detects load, the application requests more gears with its OpenShift supplies. As you can see, I've limited the nodes to only six gears per node. In a real installation, you would probably want a lot more, and adding a node would be a pretty rare event, but I wanted to see it over the span of a few minutes. So we'll just fast forward a bit. Now we're past the 80% capacity threshold I set, so OpenShift is going to request a new node host from OpenStack. Here let's watch the node creation finish. The node joins the OpenShift message bus and is added to a resource pool we call a district. We can also see the node and its volume have been added in OpenStack. We add some more traffic, the gear numbers go up, and we're adding a third node. More traffic, more gears, and a fourth node. In case you're wondering, you can set limits on your scaled apps so they don't automatically fill your infrastructure. So you just saw how we can install OpenShift Enterprise using OpenStack as the infrastructure layer, and then set up OpenShift to request additional resources as needed from OpenStack, hands-free with no administrator involved. So it's actually a pretty good marriage. We're doing a lot of stuff on customers with OpenStack and OpenShift together. I mean, customers are just sort of going all in on this OpenStack from infrastructure as a service to platforms as a service. I wanted to show you just a couple of stats of what's happening online at Amazon right now on OpenShift. Typically, about on a, on a daily basis, we had about there's about a thousand new applications that users actually create on OpenShift, and that means that we actually have to burst and we have to add about a, typically about a node a day, um, a thousand, actually a thousand applications per day, and about a node um, um, about a node you say to handle that capacity. And then t when you look at the aggregate traffic that those applications are actually serving, it's you know 690 million pages. Um, per month. And then, and we're talking about gear hours, that's how we do the math if we think about how much computation resources um, that an app is using. And that all sort of, this, this one OpenShift tier uses about 13 million Amazon minutes um, each and every month. Um, so I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about what we announced yesterday, which was RDO. And so the whole point of RDO is it's a, it's a free community supported distribution from Red Hat um, that Red Hat's leading. Um, and the whole point of it was is that what we wanted to do is we wanted to, you hear a lot about sort of continuous deployment. What we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to track upstream really quickly. All, all the technology work that's happening inside of OpenStack at OpenStack.org, how do we actually, on a really fast cadence, on a daily basis, actually package that up, uh, put it into a distribution that installs neatly on top of Fedora, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and all the Enterprise Linux derivatives that are out there. So when you sort of look at the sort of the timeline of what of, of OpenStack releases, the horizontal bar is, you know, as you move from like Grizzly to Havana and all the milestones. And then as the major releases come out, there's stable branches. Those are the, you know, the up and to the right um, arrows. So even after Grizzly's out, now they'll become a stable branch. Um, so what RDO will do is RDO will track all of that. Um, so anytime there's a, a milestones or interim drops, but actually in sort of the world of sort of continuous deployment, it's actually probably going to get a lot better than that. It, there's no reason that any sort of feature or bug fix anywhere along the path um, that we won't be able to release. Um, so it's, it's a new landing page at, at Red Hat right now, openstack.redhat.com, and that's where you go to find RDO. And so on the customer side, um, you know, it was no surprise. Once we started putting developers on OpenStack and once we joined the foundation, that you know, the model for us is a subscription. And what that means for us is, is beyond just the bits. It means like, how do we bring the customers full on certifications? How do we create certifications that all of our partners, hardware and software works together um, with OpenStack? Everything from support and training and all the other things that customers have been known to expect. The case of extended life is often the bane of our existence. You know, from Linux alone, often customers lock it down for 10 years on just one implementation and you have to maintain that. Um, that's going to happen, you know, less obviously in the early days of OpenStack, but that typically will be something that we'll need to be able to um, take care of. 
Um, on the other side of OpenStack, you know, the, our, rich, our initial release was based on Essex um, for our subscription product. And then it was, um, it was right before Folsom came out, and then that was updated to Folsom. That went into what we call a preview mode. So it was basically up on the, up on the website. Um, customers and users could come and um, you know, fill out a form and, and download a preview version. Um, but we also did is, you know, like other companies, we started working and hand-holding um, shoulder to shoulder with companies that were going to be very aggressive on OpenStack, and there's about 23 of those today. Um, and that's sort of just how the enterprise subscription sort of tears off. This is the upstream first model, what we talk about a lot. We can't get something into the product if we're not shadowing and tied in tightly with what's happening in RDO and upstream. So now as of, as of this week, though, we've gone to the next phase of our OpenStack uh, product offering. And so what happens is now all of a sudden, inside of Red Hat's um, nearly 6,000 people, our support organization is, is really up and running on OpenStack. So what that means is now we can widen sort of the customer landscape. So now we're actually, sales are actually up, able to nominate up to 200 customers to bring them through a support relationship through OpenStack. But as, as John was talking about, to us it's all about the ecosystem. Nobody really wants one vendor's OpenStack product and just deploying it in their data center. It's all about how it works with everything else. And OpenStack has probably perhaps one of the best architectures for making that happen because it's, you know, as we've talked about, it's very pluggable, um, but there's integrations that need to happen at the, both the compute and hardware tier, at the storage tier, network tier, um, you know, management ISVs and whatnot. So for us, that meant that we need to have a formal program for how do we actually work with all of the other uh, partners in the ecosystem. And that was launched this week with Intel and, and Cisco coming at the alliance level. This is how it really sort of fits into the Red Hat stack, right? And so um, you know, for us, the cornerstone for all you know, platform development is Red Hat Enterprise Linux with KVM inside. You know, that's how we deal with hardware certification, and that's where applications land. Um, and what the, what the interesting study that we saw yesterday, or Sunday, and I think was presented uh, yesterday as well, was sort of the user study on you know, who's using OpenStack of over 400 people that were deploying OpenStack. I think it was 72% of them are deploying OpenStack today on KVM. So it's really a, a greenfield environment. So Red Hat supporting Swift and Cinder, the, you know, the storage solutions that are for, for block and object that are part of, of OpenStack, but as well as adding, we add Gluster to that package for scale out storage. Um, the open controller should be, should be a wireframe because it's not a filled-in box yet. You know, we partner with, with people that make great network controllers, whether they're hardware and software. But the, you know, we think the industry needs an, an, um, a really open software-based controller. We joined um, Open Daylight, as did, as did many other people. And that's our, we want to have a place to throw down developers on an open source uh, network controller. And then OpenStack for infrastructure as a service and OpenShift for platform as a service. And then up with CloudForms that was found its way in through an acquisition recently. And that's how you actually go to the last mile for cloud for us. Everything from sort of metering, billing, um, and orchestration. So as Jonathan said, I want to do a little bit of a shout out. As much as we talk a lot about companies and, com and foundations, you know, it's really people that have built Grizzly. And we wanted to like, um, there's 517 people, so it's growing really fast. But rather than just sort of look at stats and say, you know, is it going to be 600 next month, we wanted to actually, we looked at some of the people that we thought made a really great contribution to Grizzly, and we wanted to recognize them right now. I mean, we're changing, we're changing the face of IT, and we're doing it in the open source way. And, uh, you know, at this conference, seeing the number of people here and the energy around the project, I think it's pretty fascinating, and, and uh, we're going places, so people need to see it and watch what we're doing. Right, so I've been working on OpenStack almost ever since the first birthday party in July 2010. I was one of the first hires at Rackspace, a community manager and a technical writer. So that was amazing to see that right off the bat, an open source project wanted to make sure documentation was a priority. So my general focus on OpenStack is on the Nova side. Um, I really jump all over the place there wherever help is needed. The CI team, uh, and we're also trying to call ourselves the infrastructure team because it turns out that we do more than CI these days. But we run all of all of the developer tools and automation that the OpenStack project uses to land the massive amount of changes that it does. So a lot of people might think I'm going to say that the thing I'm most proud of in Grizzly was the operations manual, the operations guide. But in reality, one of the things I'm most proud of is that we got started with an internship program in OpenStack. 
So there's a program called the GNOME Outreach Program for Women, and they tend to encourage women to apply for these open source internships. Well, the obvious answer to that is that uh, Salometer graduated from incubation and is now an integrated project. Uh, but I think even more important than that is the fact that the community developed the process for allowing new projects to join the foundation and be in integrated projects. It's about uh, having everyone on the same rhythm because people come from very different backgrounds and companies and we actually want them on the same schedule with our deadlines rather than their internal deadlines. So my role is to make sure that they all share the same rhythm and, and we are a single group of, of people working toward a common goal. So I, I, I joined Red Hat late in 2011 and that happened to be when uh, Red Hat was getting involved in OpenStack as a company. I, started working on Nova and since have become more and more involved and I was recently elected as the, the project technical leader in the PTL of the Nova project. Grizzly has a lot of new exciting features. I'm especially interested in the uh, cells feature for Nova and the improvements that have come along in OpenStack networking. Uh, Mark McLean is the, another DreamHost employee. He's the new PTL for the OpenStack networking project and they're doing a lot of incredible work there with uh, bringing new features in and a lot of good collaboration with a lot of very different interests. Uh, during the Grizzly cycle, I'm really most proud of getting the cells code in Chomp. We have been talking about it for uh, a couple different releases, and we finally, uh, finally made it happen. The crazy thing we did during the Grizzly release was we finally were able to pull people into a room, gather together, and work on the operator's guide. I'm, I'm proud of the project in general. I think the, the growth itself is outstanding. Um, just looking at the development community, the, the number of contributors has grown. Earlier this morning, someone said that we had 550 technical contributors to our last release over a six month time frame. So it's, it's, a, it's about enabling the collaboration across the 200 some odd companies that we've got all trying, to, all trying to hack on this thing. The collaboration space we've been enabling between multiple companies to work on the same thing, rather than reinvent uh, separately those, those, those things. That's where one, one aspect where open source actually shines is by enabling that to happen into, into those common collaboration spaces between companies. We can, we can do this in a way that still allows people to have companies and to, and to be successful on the business front. But we can do that without, without hamstringing the users. We can, we can actually, actually make the world a better place for crying out loud. So last couple of things. So look at these projects, Linux, OpenStack, Hadoop, Rails, Mongo, Git, Cassandra. They got three core things in common, right? I know you guys all know the first ones, they're all open source, right? But interesting enough, they're also examples of what we call sort of redefining IT. Open source has gone past the days of where it's just trying to replace some sort of proprietary module and make it free and open source. These things are all creating new capability for customers that they just didn't have before. And the third thing, which I think is perhaps the most interesting of, of all, is none of these were started by, by vendors. Every one of these was started by either end users or developers. And I think that's sort of the turning point that we've entered in sort of the open source community in IT. And so I think it's, it's really clear to say that without open source in general, the cloud as we know it wouldn't exist because these companies, if they existed at all, would certainly be shadows of what they are today. And while perhaps we can't say that about OpenStack yet today, I think if we sort of look out two or three years from now, I, I think it'll be really hard to imagine what the industry would be like without OpenStack. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Brian. So that uh, brings us to the end of our, our morning session here. Sorry we ran a little long. Again, everything is gonna be starting later downstairs. And uh, we'll be back in here in the morning. And if you've seen the schedule, you see that we have some, uh, some great additional users. We have some scientists doing uh, high energy physics. And we have the NSA. And we have uh, additional keynotes coming. So I hope you guys had a good morning. And go have a good remainder of the day.